Um, important to note that uh, there are entire classes devoted to World War II, um, and even in those classes you can't cover everything of, of note and uh, importance that you need to. So we're going to crank this out and you know, we'll see how long this lecture is, 50 minutes or, or so, 45 minutes. Uh, can't cover it all, right? Can't cover it all, but want to give you an overview, want to focus on sort of United States uh, involvement um, for the purposes of our uh, American history class. And of course, those dates, 1941 to 1945, those represent the years the United States um, is fighting in World War II. Um, war itself, traditionally, uh, the, the beginning, we, we mark that with uh, September 1st, 1939, with the German invasion of Poland. So we're going to look at the start. We're going to look at how the United States get, gets involved. We'll look at the war in the Pacific. We'll look at the, the war in Europe. Um, and then United States use of, of the atomic bomb, some stuff that's happening on the home front. I've got several different video clips that I want to share with you guys. Um, so that is, that's the plan. So if we look at the, if we look at the 1930s, there are ominous developments, concerning developments in both Asia and Europe throughout the, the 1930s, and Japan and Germany acting aggressively in, in those um, two, two areas of the world. So, and by the mid 1930s, clear that sort of international rules of law are beginning to, to fall apart. In 1931, Japan seeking to ex expand its power, its military reach will invade Manchuria, which was a, a province. A northern province in China. Six years later, um, move further and further into China when the Japanese overrun the city of Nanjing. They, they uh, kill an estimated 300,000 Chinese prisoners of war and civilians. So this is concerning to the world. This is concerning to the United States. And if you look in Europe, also concerning developments there. Um, and those are, of course, orchestrated by Adolf Hitler, who had risen to head the National Socialist Party in Germany, the, or, or the Nazi Party, um, had become Chancellor of Germany in 1934, and then started to you know, seek to consolidate his rule in Germany, and then take land um, in, in Europe, and right? started to expand the, the, the power of uh, the German nation. So, one of the first things that Hitler will do in power is start to build back up the German uh, military, which was, uh, as, as you will recall from the Treaty of Versailles, the, the end of the First World War, this is a violation of the Treaty of Versailles. Germany is building back up its military power post World War I. 1936, he will send troops to occupy the Rhineland, which was a demilitarized zone between France and Germany after the First World War. Um, and really the failure of, of countries like France and Britain to oppose um, Hitler's actions, to oppose these claims, uh, really emboldens him, right? He feels even more confident that these co countries won't muster the strength to, to oppose him, and even, even the United States, right, uh, early on. Uh, we'll annex Austria in 1938, we'll so make a claim of Austria, uh, as well as the Sudetenland, was which was an ethnically German part of Czechoslovakia, and then later in the year, we'll uh, take up all, all of that country. And then, as I said, in 1939, um, we'll, we'll invade Poland. But, um, and so you might say, well, why, right? Why is, why is no one opposing these actions? And again, the context matters, right? The, the context of the time period matters. So Roosevelt, correct me. Franklin Roosevelt is very concerned about these things, but feels like his hands are tied because the United States European allies are engaging in this policy of appeasement, right? giving in to these demands with the hope of avoiding full-scale war, a hope of avoiding violence. And part of the reason that this is a policy that these European nations engage in is because they all remember the First World War, and they don't want a repeat of that. They, they uh, all the loss of life, and you know, the question is, well, for what? Right? What's the outcome? Those um, fighting over 
um, hundreds of feet, right, of, of trenches. And, um, this is still very much in the minds of these European leaders. So the British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain, he comes back from the, the Munich Conference in 1938, which awarded Hitler the Sudetenland, bragging that he had, um, uh, by doing this, had guaranteed peace in our time, right? By giving in to these demands, um, that was uh, that was securing peace. Obviously, not not the case. And as we know, uh, Europe was really just step one as far as Hitler's concerned. Really had his sights set on world domination. So I want to actually share a clip from a documentary that sort of gets at this. It's a a veteran. American veteran talking about his experience with a, a German prisoner of war, and through this exchange sort of reveals um, how Hitler's goal very much was world, world domination. In the process of this battle, we took about 18 or 19 German prisoners a young man, approximately 24 years of age, turned to me and in a voice completely accent free, he said, where are you from? I said, I'm from the United States. Where in the United States? The Northeast, I said. Where Northeast? I said, I'm from Connecticut. Where in Connecticut? He was persisting. I said, yes, I'm from Waterbury, Connecticut. Ah, yes, he said, Waterbury, at the junction of the Naugatuck and Mad Rivers. Now you have to know a bit about the area. The Naugatuck is a fairly substantial river, but the Mad River is a little stream that you can jump across without any trouble. Anyone who knew this uh, was puzzled. I said, how did you possibly know that? He said, I was in training for the administration. The administration of what, I said. He said, the administration of the territories. My blood ran cold. I couldn't imagine that Hitler, in his wildest imagination, not only had figured he practically had Europe in his grasp, but he also figured that he would control America too. So those are those are the stakes, right, in, in World War II. Um, I want to see if I can find this. I forgot to bring my physical copy of Yertle the Turtle. Let's see if I can find it quickly online for you. Oh, that's not good enough. That doesn't have the images. Okay, well, I'll have to, I'll have to bring in my copy. I have it at home. Um, but I don't know if you guys remember this uh, Dr. Seuss book, Yertle the Turtle, um, or if you read it as a kid, but uh, what you might not know is the inspiration for Yertle, the character of Yertle the Turtle is actually Adolf Hitler. Um, that was uh, Seuss's inspiration. Uh, for this, uh, and actually, I think, I uh, believe that his initial version, Yertle the Turtle, actually had like a Hitler mustache, and the editors were like, yeah, you can't do that. That's uh, a bit too obvious. So when I read this to my children, I read it with a German accent. I'm kidding. I don't do that. Don't judge me. Um, but maybe I'll, uh, I'll have to bring it in so we can have story time. Uh, if you read the book, you get the sense that it is very much a um, story of someone whose power is not enough, right? The character of Yertle the Turtle just wants more and more, right? Wants to be higher and higher. Um, uh, 
and, and, and rule more and more. And you, you can certainly see that comparison. So Dr. Seuss, you might be aware, very prolific as a cartoonist during World War II, and I'll show you a couple more um, Dr. Seuss cartoons uh, here in a minute. But that's what's going on uh, in Europe and in Asia. This is current, uh, concerning to the United States, certainly. And the United States will start to take more and more steps to get involved, but not directly. And, and, and part of the reason is FDR is going to run for an unprecedented third term for President of the United States. Felt the international situation was too chaotic. The situation at home was still too fragile in terms of economic recovery. Felt like the country needed continuity in terms of leadership. So he's going to run for a third term. And he wants to get involved. He, he call, refers to Hitler as a mad gangster, views him as a mad gangster that needs to be reined in and um, controlled. Uh, but felt like his hands are tied, not only because of the policy of appeasement. Obviously, that will change right after 1939. Appeasement's out the window, and now we're at war. Uh, but the United States is not at war. And part of that is there is very much an isolationist perspective in 1940 and 1941 in the United States where people do not want to get involved in another European war. Here's what FDR wrote to a friend, uh, a newspaper editor. He said, what worries me especially is that public opinion over here is patting itself on the back uh, every morning and thanking God for the Atlantic Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. This idea, well, that's, that's happening over there. We don't need to get involved in uh, another one of these. But FDR still wants to help, so initially he will um, provide weapons military aid to Britain on a cash and carry basis, meaning that uh, Britain would have to pay for the, wep the weapons, military supplies up front in cash, and then carry them, transport them in British ships. But not willing to go beyond that because he's running for election, and there is this isolationist perspective. There's this committee known as the America First Committee, which is arguing and advocating that the United States um, do, that does not participate um, in, in World War II. And some, you know, big name people who are, are a part of this, like Charles Lindbergh, who I mentioned, right, made that first nonstop solo flight across the Atlantic Ocean, people like Henry Ford, um, big names who, who are arguing for, for this. Much to the frustration of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, but also, guy we were just talking about, Dr. Seuss. So this is a cool website if you uh, want to check out some of Dr. Seuss's uh, cartoons during World War II. Um, but frequently would go after, in, 41, in, in 1940 and 1941, would go after this isolationist perspective, um, uh, America first, to, to criticize it. And so here's one that uh, is pretty famous these days. You maybe have seen this before. But there's America first reading to a book to the children. It's called Adolf the Wolf. And then at the top it says, uh, and the wolf chewed up the children and spit out their, their, their bones, but those were foreign children and it really didn't matter. So Dr. Seuss was woke, as the kids would say. Um, maybe the kids don't say that anymore. But um, very much, right, taking, taking some swings at, at this isolationist perspective and saying, you know, there's evil in the world. Um, the United States should help stop it, right? The United States should, should play a role. Frequently, we'll depict... Um, uh, the United States or isolationism as this like big lazy bird that the United States is just sitting around, there's bombs and bullets flying all over, there's chaos and the United States is just sort of lounging around. Dr. Seuss will depict that and I'll show you how he responds, how Dr. Seuss depicts that isolationist perspective after the attack at Pearl Harbor here in a second. Um, so FDR will win that unprecedented third term in one of his famous fireside chats, radio addresses. He, he says that the United States will become the great arsenal of democracy. We'll start uh, providing aid as much as possible to Britain and China in their fights against Germany and Japan. We'll encourage Congress to pass the Lend-Lease Act in 1941. Britain can't just pay for all this stuff up front, you know, struggling. It's nearly bankrupt trying to finance and fight this war. So. Now the United States will fund aid to those countries fighting Germany and Japan. Um, we'll offer them, we'll lend them these supplies with the promise that it, it be returned, paid back after the war. Um, so the United States now doing a bit more. The United States will also freeze Japanese assets, essentially halting all trade between the United States and Japan. And as we know, Japan responds 
pretty aggressively to this, right? To to this decision, and um, and perhaps, right? Perhaps going to um, attack the United States with with or without this decision by FDR to free of Japanese assets. So, December seventh, nineteen forty one. Japanese planes launched from aircraft carriers in the Pacific will bomb attack the naval base in Pearl Harbor of Hawaii. In a span of a few hours, it's a pretty devastating attack. This is the first attack by a foreign power on American soil since the War of 1812, since those American forces came down from Canada, or sorry, British forces came down from Canada and attacked uh, DC, right? Lit it on fire. We, we talked about that. So it's been a long time since the United States has been attacked on its home soil. And it is a devastating surprise attack. In a few hours, you have more than 2,000 American servicemen are killed, 187 aircraft, 18 naval vessels, including eight battleships, are destroyed or damaged. But by a stroke of luck, fortune, something more than that, uh, perhaps, if, if that's how you interpret it, there's no aircraft carriers stationed at Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941. And these Pearl, or, or, sorry, these aircraft carriers will be decisive, play a very important role and the island hopping campaign and the United States war effort in the Pacific theater, the fact that those aircraft carriers are not destroyed um, is, is significant. Uh, so I wanna play a clip for you of radio broadcast. So this is sort of, I mean, it gives you some perspective of what Americans would hear, uh, how they would find out that Japan had just attacked this naval base in Hawaii. to give you uh, a little perspective there. Um, so there are conspiracies out there to this day that suggest that FDR knew of the planned attack at Pearl Harbor but did nothing to stop it because he wanted to bring the United States into World War II. Just so we're clear, no evidence that supports this at all, but in case you, you've ever heard that. So the next day, FDR will ask Congress for a declaration of war. This is where he famously refers to December 7th as a date which will live in infamy. So I want to play that speech. I just, you know, a few sections of, of that speech for you. Um, one of the more famous uh, presidential addresses in all of uh, American history. If I can see it, there it is. Senators and representatives, I have the distinguished honor of presenting the President of the United States. Mr. Vice President, Mr. Speaker, members of the Senate, of the House of Representatives, Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live 
in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. The United States was at peace with that nation, with the people. When I assert that we will not only defend ourselves to the uttermost, but will make it very certain that this form of treachery shall never again endanger us. Hostilities exist. There is no blinking at the fact that our people, our territory, and our interests are in grave danger. With confidence in our armed forces, with the unbounding determination of our people, we will gain the inevitable triumph so help us God. I ask that the Congress declare that since the unprovoked and dastardly attack by Japan on Sunday, December 7th, 1941, a state of war has existed between the United States and the Japanese Empire. Okay, so the combined vote in Congress in favor of declaring war was 388 in favor of the United States entering into World War II, uh, one against. The one dissenting vote was Jeanette Rankin of Montana, was a pacifist, had also voted against the United States getting involved in uh, the First World War, right? voted, voted against that as well. But obviously passes, uh, so now the United States has declared war in Japan. The next day, Germany declared war in the United States. Japan and Germany have an alliance dating to the 1930s. So now the United States is fully involved, right, has joined this largest war in human history and will fight on uh, in these two theaters. So uh, again, can't go into it, don't have time to go into a ton of detail about the United States in each theater, but just want to highlight what, what's going on sort of in, in the Pacific theater against Japan and the European theater against Nazi Germany. So really, uh, you maybe have heard this before, sometimes World War II is referred to as a gross national product war. Uh, meaning whichever side was able to outproduce the other was going to be the, the one that wins. And so sometimes we'll look back at the, uh, World War II and say, well, of course the United States prevails, right? And of course, with its industrial might, um, no other country or alliance in the world could, could compete with that. But if you look at, especially the first few months, early history of the war in Pacific Theater for the United States, it does not go well. It does not go well. Um, you have... Uh, Japan that's conquering a lot of territory, already occupying French Indochina, early 1942, conquers, conquers Burma and Siam, so present day Myanmar and Thailand will take control of the Dutch East Indies, so in Indonesia, um, sense of oil fields there, which would be important for literally fueling their military campaigns. Occupied Guam, the Philippines, other Pacific Islands, Apatan, in the Philippines, the Japanese will force the surrender of 78,000 American and Filipino uh, troops. So to uh, largest surrender in American military history, um, forcing uh, that, that surrender. And you maybe have heard of the Tan Death March after the surrender, thousands of soldiers will die on that ensuing march to their, their camp. And then you know, uh, thousands more die of disease and starvation once they are in, in that POW camp. So not uh, great for the United States, but it starts to change sort of summer, spring of 1942. 
Um, a couple key key moments. So the Battle of the Coral Sea and Battle of Midway uh, Island are, are important. So at the Battle of Coral Sea, May 1942, the United States is able to turn back a Japanese naval fleet that was intent on invading uh, Australia. Battle of Midway Island um, in June 1942. Uh, the United States is able to inflict devastating losses on the Japanese Navy, get a foothold in the Pacific Theater, allows the United States to then begin engaging in its island hopping strategy of sort of going from small island to small island, making their way closer and closer to mainland Japan with, um, so right, occupying each of these individual islands and fighting on these islands notoriously difficult, famously difficult, in part because Japanese soldiers are taught to fight to the very last man. They're taught never to surrender. Surrender is dishonorable. So it's literally going into these islands and, and rooting out and fighting every last Japanese soldier. So very uh, high casualty numbers in these battles. And, and, you know, the fighting on these islands becomes so famous that you hear these names now and you rec most uh, Americans would, would recognize them. Um, so Okinawa, Iwo Jima, uh, Iwo Jima, Solomon Islands, Guadalcanal, Hillary. You, you've at least heard of some of those, um, I'm guessing, and, and the reason most of us have, can recognize those names is because of what happens in 42 through, through 45, um, 1942 and 45, and, and the battles that, that took place there. Uh, okay, so struggle early on, but momentum, although it's slow going, the United States has sort of tur turns a corner in the middle of 1942. War in Europe, the United States takes, will fight a little bit in some of the, the early campaigns in the European theater, but most of the focus for the United States, 42 and 43, is in the Pacific. Obviously not surprising, Japan is the one who attacked the United States. Major American involvement doesn't start for the United States until the D-Day invasion, June 6, 1944, with um, the goal of liberating France from Nazi occupation. So this is an invasion into Normandy, France, and, and landings on, on these beaches in Normandy, France, uh, overseen by uh, General Dwight D. Eisenhower, leader of this operation. More than 200,000 American, British, Canadian soldiers will land on the beaches of Normandy, France. Um, over the next few weeks, you have more than a million troops that will follow them ashore. It makes this the most massive amphibious operation in military history. Largest sea land operation in uh, world military history. Intense fighting, um, but the Ger Germans will re retreat uh, east and, and eventually in um, uh, August of 44, by August 44, Paris is liberated. So this is a, a big moment in the fighting the European theater. Um, a couple of your documents are soldiers looking back, oral history interviews, talking about what it was like for them um, to be a part of the D-Day invasion. Um, you know, some of the sections of the beach, so there are different names, Omaha Beach, uh, very high casualty numbers for those who are on these landing crafts and those doors swings open, swing, uh, will, will swing open and you have German machine guns that are waiting for those doors to open in the first several rows. It's uh, you know like 100% uh, casualty rate there. So um, interesting to read their words and, and how they remember looking way back decades of, of what they remember about that experience. However, something to keep in mind with fighting the European theater, the most, a lot of people would argue some of the most important, if not the most important fighting actually took place in the Eastern Front, which was the Soviet Union fighting against Nazi Germany. Um, so this is, we don't talk about as much in this country, you know, because the United States is not involved, but um, this is a devastating loss that happens, right? The siege of Stalingrad, Germans will, will go deep into uh, Russia. Turns out to be a mistake, difficult winter conditions will be surrounded. The uh, German uh, army that, that fights um, this siege of uh, who engages in, in this war over Stalingrad will be forced to surrender. So incredibly high casualty numbers. It's a crippling loss for the Germans. This, this fighting takes place between August of 42, January of 43. Um, that's a major turning point that the Germans surrender in, in January of 1943. But 
Um, just to give you a sense of how intense this fighting is in the Eastern Front between the uh, Germany and the Soviet Union, there's estimated 13.6 million German casualties in World War II. Of those 13.6, 10 million came from fighting uh, on the Russian front, right? Fighting the Soviet Union. So you can see sort of both sides, how they're, um, it's, it's moving in a positive direction for the allied forces. You have the United States taking France and starting to push in towards Berlin, the Soviet Union um, controlling that Eastern front and pushing west and uh, both descending uh, toward, towards Berlin. So momentum is, is um, starting to, to move in the direction that the United States uh, ha had hoped as we move forward in 43-44. Uh, uh, important to note this, that we talk about military, military casualties, that's just a small portion. There's millions and millions of civilian casualties for various reasons, most famously as a result of, of the Holocaust, um, Hitler's campaign, what he called his final solution, extermination of undesirable people as far as he defined it, various, right, um, gypsies, uh, homosexuals, um, th those with a disability and above all Jew, uh, uh, Jews. So by 1945, six million Jewish men, women, and children had died in Nazi death camps and Nazi concentration camps. Um, and this is another, this is such an important legacy of World War II. And obviously we see the stakes of the outcome of this even more. Had, had Nazi Germany prevailed we think about how many more millions of lives would have been taken um, to, to further this vision that, that Hitler had. Um, so it's, a, it's obviously a positive outcome for the, for the world that the Allies win for a lot of reasons, not the least of which it, it ends this um, policy. So um, I may have mentioned this before in class, but there's Holocaust deniers out there, people who deny that the Holocaust existed, that it actually took place. Um, it's garbage, and um, I, I think a lot of people, you know, they're just misguided. Um, but the roots in this are, are, are it's racism, it's anti anti-Semitism, to deny people their suffering, to deny people their history. It's a way that you can undermine or try to undermine a group of people. It's a way you can insult a group of people. Um, so it's prejudice where this comes from. But it's important that we address right, overwhelming evidence of the Holocaust happening. This is not a question at all. There's no debate to be had, but it's dangerous if we allow this misinformation to spread. Um, because if you, if you don't underscore the, the Holocaust and the reality that it was and what, the devastating loss of life, you expose yourself as a society, as a civil, civilization for allowing it to potentially happen uh, again. So to me, this is a lesson in why history matters and why you can't forget these things and, and why um, we must not allow narratives like the Holocaust did, didn't occur to spread, that we, we must always um, be arbiters of historical truth. Okay? Um, so I'll get off my soapbox, I'll stop preaching, but um, as we're winding down this class, and, and some of you maybe will never take another history class, uh, I hope this is a lesson you take with you in your life um, for, for why history matters, why, why it's important to remember things, why it's important to remember devastating and tragic things, uh, perhaps, especially. Okay, um, concerning developments domestically for the United States, and uh, most famously with the policy of internment. Internment means to imprison, right, during wartime, imprison someone during wartime. And um, military leaders will persuade FDR to issue Executive Order 9066, February 1942. This called for the relocation of all people of Japanese descent from the West Coast to camps. Um, why the West Coast? Well, that's where most people of Japanese descent lived, right? That's, that's where their, their communities were. More than 110,000 men, women, and children rounded up, taken from their homes, and moved to camps. This is sort of like military-style discipline. They're, they're woken up early in the morning for roll call. They eat in large mess halls. Um, no sense of privacy, not proper medical facilities, of course. They're in horse stalls and stables and makeshift barracks and, 
and shacks to, to hold um, the, these people. And there's searchlights, there's barbed wire fences, there's armed guards. This is, uh, this is a, yeah, like a prison, right? uh, essentially a, a prison camp uh, that the, these people are forced into. And, and the, well, you ask why their loyalty is questioned because of their ethnicity, because of, of their, um, their, their background, right? their heritage, their loyalty to the United States is called into question. And um, this is an unfortunate, clearly an unfortunate uh, reality domestically for the United States in, in World War II. And another powerful lesson that we can, um, uh, we, we can look at. Uh, so I actually want to play a clip for you of George Takei, who, you know, most famous for being on Star Trek. He's now very popular on social media these days. but. Uh, as a kid, child lived in, in one of these camps, and this is him talking about his experience for, for his family and what he remembered of uh, that life in an internment camp. That stereotype of Asian Americans as the enemy was all too real for George Takei. From his very youngest days growing up in Los Angeles, I remember that morning. In fact, I can never forget that morning. It was a terrifying morning. I was in the living room looking out the front window, and I saw two soldiers come marching up our driveway. And I saw at the end of their rifles shiny bayonets. They stomped up to our front door, our two bedroom home on Garnet Street in Los Angeles and banged on the front door. It was terrifying. My father answered and we were ordered out of our home. George Takei's family had committed no crime. Along with thousands of other law-abiding Japanese Americans, they were taken from their home in California in 1942 and forced to relocate to an internment camp. The reason was this. On December 7, 1941, Japan bombed the U.S. Navy base in Pearl Harbor. Overnight, America was at war with Japan, and the U.S. government became suspicious of anyone of Japanese heritage. As a group, these U.S. citizens were labeled by their government as enemy non-aliens. What's a non-alien? That's a citizen. They couldn't even call us citizens then. We were enemy non-aliens. Why? Because of this, we were taken to the horse stables. And thinking back now, I can't imagine how degrading and humiliating it must have been for my parents to take their three children, one a baby, from a two bedroom home and told to sleep in that narrow, smelly horse stall. I remember the barbed wire fences and the sentry tower, the uh, searchlight that followed me when I made the night runs from our barrack to the uh, latrine. It was a racist act, pure and simple, and it was an unconstitutional act. I mean, you can't imprison people for, for their race. And that's what we were imprisoned for. So there's important lessons here uh, for us as well. It really demonstrates how easy it is for civil rights to be sacrificed in a time of crisis, in a time of war, um, and how basic freedoms can be undermined, and how silent so much of the country can be. The organizations that were set aside to protect civil rights were silent. Um, the courts refused to get involved. Very few members of Congress uh, question or criticize this decision and you might well, you might think well it's clear right it's it's a clear violation of, of freedoms and civil rights um, but those are in history we have examples and this is one of, of how those are sacrificed um, 
for a, a cause, right? And how racism and paranoia can, can play a, a, a part in that. So, um, something to keep in mind, right? Something to keep in mind, again, um, as we move, move forward. So FDR will, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt will run for an unprecedented fourth term as president of the United States. He will win, but dies uh, shortly into that fourth term, doesn't live long enough to see Allied victory, dies of a st stroke on April 12, 1945. So to his successor, Harry S. Truman falls one of the more momentous decisions to ever confront an American president, whether or not to use the atomic bomb. Truman, as vice president, didn't even know the United States had a nuclear weapon, was not aware. When he becomes president, the Secretary of War informed him that the United States had developed, quote, the most terrible weapon ever known in human history. Bomb is a practical realization of Albert Einstein's theory of relativity. So um, E equals MC squared, energy equals mass times the speed of light squared. So something uh, with a small amount of mass under the right circumstances can release a tremendous amount of energy. And in the case of an atomic bomb and through nuclear fusion or nuclear fission, so either splitting or combining of atoms, you can release that, that energy. Um, if you want a more scientific explanation of the atomic bomb, you'll have to go to your physics professors. That's as much as I have that like hurt my brain um, trying to do that just now. So uh, you're welcome. I've sacrificed for all of you in the name of education. Um, actually, in 1939, FDR, or, I'm sorry, Albert Einstein wrote to um, FDR, who had Einstein fled from Nazi Germany and wrote the President of the United States saying, hey, Nazi scientists are working on developing an atomic bomb, a nuclear weapon, you should do the same. FDR will listen and authorize this with the Manhattan Project in 1945, authorizes uh, this top secret project in which American scientists were working on developing this atomic bomb during World War II. Um, successfully test this in July in New Mexico, July of 1945. So now the United States has this technology that no one else has. Um, Einstein will actually go to his grave regretting any role that he played um, in sort of starting, right, in, in starting the dawn of, of the atomic age or the, or the nuclear age. So uh, Truman really doesn't hesitate. He makes the decision to, to actually use this technology. Then after they test it in July, the next month, Truman will um, uh, go ahead and approve, right? August 6, 1945, an American plane will drop an atomic bomb over Hiroshima, Japan. Detonates over Hiroshima. The, the the city is chosen in part because, unlike a lot of Japanese cities that had suffered losses and, and, and been devastated by American bombing campaigns, this city had not large military presence there as well. So when the bomb goes off, the city's population, you have 280,000 civilians, 40,000 soldiers, approximately 70,000 die immediately. Um, of course, atomic bombs release deadly uh, radiation. So over the next months, that toll will just, death toll will continue to increase. Um, by the end of the year, it, it reaches 140,000, thousands more over the next five years as complications for having been exposed to uh, this, this radiation. Um, three days pass, August 9th, 1945, J Japan has not surrendered. The United States will drop a second bomb over Nagasaki, killing an additional 70,000 people. Um, within the week, right, so on that, actually on that uh, same day, the Soviet Union declared war on Japan. Um, and within the week, J Japan will surrender. So the United States achieved, or the Allied forces achieved victory. Um, over Nazi Germany in May of 1945. And so the attention for all the Allied forces, including the Soviet Union, was on Japan. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and so with that, now the, the Japan is faced with the possibilities of fighting war against the United States and the Soviet Union. And now with these two atomic bombs that have been dropped on Japan, they make the decision 
to surrender. As you might know, as you might imagine, the decision by Truman to drop the atomic bomb is still incredibly controversial and debated as to the merits of it. You have people who uh, argue that Japan was close to surrendering and um, unnecessary to engage in that action. You have people who argue, well, Japan is, as a culture, their, their soldiers are taught never to surrender. Um, so this war would drag on and then think about how intensely they were fighting over these tiny islands Pacific, a mainland invasion of Japan, actually invading the islands of Japan, what that would entail, what the, the potential American casualties would be. Truman was advised that it could potentially cost 250,000 American lives if you're going to try to invade Japan. Um, so there's, this debate continues, I would say, and maybe we can have that conversation of, of how you feel about Truman's decision. You're reading one of your primary sources is his announcement to the American people um, uh, of his decision, right? Him talking about this moment, and it's sort of interesting the angles that he takes as, as he talks about. So I'd like to talk more about his perspective in that document, but also how you guys maybe feel and, and view this, this decision. Um, by by Truman to, to use the uh, atomic bomb, but end of the you know, effectively ends World War II. The Allied forces have prevailed, but now with this atomic bomb, there's a lot of questions, right? That that this this nuclear age has begun in world history, and who will have access to the bomb, and who gets to make that decision? And then the Soviet Union will successfully test and get their own nuclear weapon in, in 1949. And then these two countries, the United States and Soviet Union, emerge as the two world powers. And they have different ideologies. They're going to compete. Um, yes, they had an alliance in World War II, but it was because they had a common enemy. Once that enemy is defeated, the tension really starts to rise. And this is what we call uh, the Cold War. So we're not going to go into, I'm off the screen again. I really just need a wife.